while I remember it. All right, so now we're recording. It's official. Welcome to the last session. Yay, week eight of the PMF course two. I always forget to do the introduction and then, then the replays start out like, you know, we've been talking forever and I always look at that and go, ah, uh, I gotta remember to give a, an introduction. So glad to have everybody on. I know that there's uh, a lot of people that were planning on coming on. Um, we had over 38 invitations. So um, I know a lot of people watch the replays. And, um, but this session really is all about having um, whatever questions you guys have, answering them, just really talking about uh, what's going on out there in PMF land and how you guys can be more competitive, how you can uh, grow your practice and um, be better practitioners and how we're really working on um, raising the bar for the, the practitioners as a whole and in the industry and all that. And so um just really glad to have all you guys on um if you've got questions and we're we're talking on something and you want to get it down it's always great to just put them into the chat um that's a great way to to share your questions then we can uh, answer them as we get to them so we don't forget about them um so whitney already has a question she said that during the injury video she states that 90 minutes as the minimum amount of time is in the injured spot. Oh, mid amount of time. Is this in the injured spot only, full body plus the injured area? That's a good question. Um, the the protocol that she really shared was was putting the PEMF on the injury and treating the injury for ninety minutes. Um, she didn't say that that was a minimum, but she just said that was more like the optimal time that she found um, you got visible re results. Uh, 60 minutes, you didn't get as much, you didn't get as many uh, or as, as good a response. And after 90 minutes, it started to diminish. So the 90 minutes was really more of um, kind of a recommended, not a minimum. But um, for her, that was really what her optimal results have been. And I can kind of share that, that 90 minutes is a really good treatment time. But she also does go into treating the whole body and, and as a, um, a way to accelerate healing, as a general rule of thumb, you want to do the whole body because as you do the whole body, you're improving the immune system. And that immune system accelerator lasts about 36 hours. So after 36 hours, you've really lost the effect of that accelerated healing capability that your body has. So um, if you've got um, an injury and you really want to do the optimal, I would say treat the whole body every 36 hours and treat the injury injured area for 90 minutes at a time. You can do more. And more is better. So, um, um, one thing I did did wonder about was the um, the portal. Has everybody gotten into the? It looks like everybody's gotten into the portal and is going through the videos and everything. I mean, you can see the progress bar. I can see the progress bar of your progress bar, and so everybody seems to be making making progress. But um, you know, some of the things that uh, you really want to check out are the, uh, the bonus section and really go through that in, in pretty good detail at least once so you know what's there. What we just posted, um, Tracy Pollard asked, uh, she's got to do a speech. And she may have already done the speech. Tracy, how did the speech go? If you're on, I know you're on. Um, I think the speech has already been on, but... Um, she needed to do a speech and, and uh, Sherry gave her a bunch of information on PMF for autism. And we just took all that information and we put it right onto the bonus section. So now there is a really good section on uh, PMF for autism 
it's got uh, case studies and um, all kinds of good stuff on there. So that would definitely be worth a read and um, it would be worth, um, you know, just uh, knowing that it's there. Um, I think I may have added to the PMF for people's side too. Um, but um, that's, that's a really, really good thing. Um, if you guys are looking for research and you're it's not finding it in the portal, it's always good to either ask it in the, um, the group and um, Sherry does monitor the group fairly frequently and, or just uh, send us off an email and um, ask us. Um, there's still an awful lot of information that, um, that was on our websites that um, hasn't been, been fully downloaded. Um, we've gotten the stuff that, that we felt was uh, particularly relevant and important, but um, Sherry is, a, as you may know, is a research nut and she's done all kinds of research and um, really has, uh, loves to do the research. So um, Tracy just put in the chat, the resources were a saving grace and the presentation was great. I'm sure you were great. Um, so everything, everything went well, Tracy, that, um, and who were you giving the, the presentation to again? Uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, the presentation was at a learning disability summit. And um, so there was anywhere from um, superintendents, teachers, um, practitioners um, of all sorts. So it was kind of a, a mixture of professions. Um, so it was, it was great. I, um, it came suddenly and, um, but it was very well received, lots of good questions. Um, actually, the presentation, I was scheduled for an hour because I was the opening guest speaker, and um, they ended up keeping me for two hours. So um, I was a little exhausted with <laughs> information, but um, it was good. I was very appreciative of their receptiveness. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, if they're keeping you longer, that's, that's always a good sign. You know, if they, they give you the, the yank, you know, after 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. It was my test and don't think for a minute, I didn't have you on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it was, it was good. Um, you mentioned the PEMF for people site. Is that where, where is that? Is that on our portal? Well, it's it's in the portal. It's um, I can't remember which week it is, but the, oh, the week okay. that we covered PMF for people. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. I was just making sure I didn't miss some site somewhere. Okay. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, we did have PEMF. Hmm, what was the name of the, the URL? We had a, a website that was really geared toward people and selling our IMRS systems, and uh, it was called pain relief PMF, I think it was, um, and, um, but uh, as a part of the, the Life Pulse thing, we needed to take that down, so there was a lot of good information on that, uh, but. It's um, a bummer. Yep, yep, well, that's why we're trying to, you know, put all, put as much information back into the, into the, uh, circulation as possible mm -hmm. and um, make it available as we can. And um, so I know uh, Tracy, I'm going to, I'm going to be fortunate enough to be going out to Wyoming and spending some time with Tracy on a one-on-one, -on -one, which is just going to be awesome. I can't wait. Um, We're looking forward to it. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if I want to, you know, leave all my, all my material in the, before we get out there, but uh, you know, if there are questions you've got, you know, let's let's bring them on. This this, like I said, this for the people that are just uh, that are just signing on. This session we found it, through our jump starts that the last session was always the best uh, for because usually people have all kinds of questions that that built up through the uh, course that they that they didn't get answered, um, and we always felt like if we had things scheduled at the end that uh, we never got to all those great questions. So um, we changed 
pretty early on as um, having the last day be all about the practitioners and what the practitioners want. Because it's funny, every single group has a completely different um, set of uh, priorities, experiences, um, interests, and I'm always amazed at the variety of things that people want to talk about um, given the opportunity. And so this is your guys' opportunity to ask away and um, don't be shy. Don't hide behind. We, we went to this format of the Zoom process, the Zoom meeting, to, to really give you guys an opportunity. And now everybody's turned off their camera and, and uh, unmuted. Being unmuted, being unmuted is, or muted is a good thing if you've got a lot of background noise and, and you forget you're on camera. You know, I've had too many horror stories of people in, in conference meetings where they start talking about things then don't realize that they're on camera and being recorded <laughs> forever. So, um, but the thing that uh, always people want to hear about is all the different types of and in uh, all the different types of, of equipment and treatment um, possibilities that are out there, even just within the the um, PEMF realm, not taking in, into consideration the, the other realms. So, um, Oh yeah, so Whitney Hicks is asking, and this is what I was getting to, you know, the competitive, the competitive conversation. Um, can we give any insight on the teachings or statements that MagnaWay promotes in regards to other PMF modalities? Every, every single one I have come in contact with seems to avoid me like the plague when I try to discuss about protocols and uses. My intentions are to raise the PMF bar in my area and they refuse to continue their education almost seem anti-pulse etc do you mean anti-pulse as far as the uh as far as the um pulse as far as the, co the um, company or anti-pulse as far as just learning things um because the some of the conversations that i've seen lately about magnawave have been completely different evidently uh the daughter um forget her name now it starts with an a um she seems to be taking over um, Pat. I bought my first machine from Pat Zemer. He was um, the, he is the owner of, of MagnaWave. MagnaWave. MagnaWave is distributor. And um, she seems to be really um, interested in doing training and interested in holding uh, workshops or, or uh, training sessions. So that's a really good thing. I always really think that Anytime um, the community manufacturers or whatever start to do more training, as long as they're training on things that are correct, um, is a good thing. Anytime you can get more people, more, no more knowledge, really, it's going to help everybody. And, you know, the PMF community really is a very, very small community. There's probably less than 1,000 people that are truly, really practitioners um, on the human side, there may be a little bit more, maybe 1,500 if you count all the chiropractors. Uh, many of the chiropractors don't do PMF full time. They do it more as a side thing. But, um, you know, so when you consider there's, you know, 230 million people in the United States alone, 58 million horses. Um, you know, I think there's 8 million horses in Texas, just in Texas. I always get a, a kick out of people ca calling me up and going, hey, I'm interested in doing PMF in Michigan. And I was just wondering if, if I'm maybe too late. I, I heard there was somebody else here in Michigan. You know, it's like how many communities you go into that have, you know, what, 14 chiropractors in a town of, you know, 2,000 people. You know, how many vets, how many, um, you know, how many hairdressers? I mean, you know, how many restaurants? You would never go into a, a town and say that there's one restaurant and go, oh, well, I was going to open a great Italian restaurant, but there's already a restaurant here. You know, and, and what we've found over and over again is the more PMF people that are out there, the more it popular it becomes. You can go into a small town and, and there'll be a couple of PMF practitioners and their business will be better than, you know, one lone wolf in a big, in a big community. 
um, because people know about it. Um, so, um, but if you want to talk about the different, uh, the, the different um, competitive machines that are out there and what, um, yeah, they seem, so, so Whitney's, your answer was there, uh, they seem anti-company. And it's probably not just toward, the, the, the biggest thing that we had when we were a MagnaWave practitioner is that our biggest competition were other MagnaWave people. And, and we really left there in, in hopes of forming something that was going to be very cooperative rather, rather than competitive. Um, we would go to shows and have another MagnaWave people there and they'd be taking down our brochures and talking trash about us and all that, which they've always done. They, they, they've always been, you know, really, really that way. Um, but our feeling has always been really that the more the better. And, you know, the best restaurant location is next to another restaurant. And, and if you um, run into people that are interested in alternative modalities, they're really your best customers. And people that have already done as long as it was a good experience people have already done pmf usually are much more receptive to doing it again so um i don't really think that that's a good strategy for them it's kind of an you know it's it's a it's a lack mentality um but magnawave has an app now that allows for easy charting any insights this may be a future option with pulse centers i've had this conversation but it was dismissed um, so I've, you know, if you look at, and, and I'm not sure what you mean by charting, but what I have done is that I have found, like, if you take my treatment sheet and you put that, say you have an iPad, um, and you put that treatment sheet on, um, an app that allows you to write on PDFs. And, and there's a bunch of them out there, free ones. And you can actually um, pull up the, uh, the treatment sheet and you can make notes right on the treatment sheet, right on your iPad, and then save it as a picture and, and in Google Photos and then make it a part of the, the, uh, the contact that you have in, in your Google Apps. So. Um, that's a, a way to do it really without any other kind of apps. Um, I'd be interested to see, we were working on something like that as far as a pulse center thing, but it doesn't sound like that went anywhere. But um, it was based on that. You just take a treatment sheet and uh, you have the ability to write on it and then save it. And, but if you use the Google apps, um, there really are, way better, <laughs> way more uh, functions, way more capabilities to use Google Apps and um, have a better result. And the apps that you use are um, Google Photos. So you can scan a Google Photo and save it to your Google Drive and it can be editable just by bringing it up as a Google Doc. <coughs> oh, excuse me. John, can you type on those as well as just write? Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. Um, and a text box or, or is it universal? Well, it depends on which, which uh, app you get, but yeah, you, like there's some, some that, that let you sign PDFs. Uh -huh. It's that, that's the technology right there. All you're doing is creating a text box, text box on a PDF. Right, right. And then you scan it into your Google fo Photos and save it to a Google Drive. If you get Google Drive, you can, you can have it on your phone. Um, if you get Google Drive and the Google apps of Google Docs, you can, you can scan it. And then you can save it right to that contact. So you just basically put all your contacts. And, and we have um, in, the, in, in our marketing class, we're, we're really taking the class and dividing it into two parts. So it's kind of an interesting segue into this. 
one part is really about the conversation that you have with your clients, your marketing message, um, how you communicate, what you do and how you do it to your clients and prospects. And then the other part of it is really the, um, <clears throat> how you use the Google apps to create a, an automated email platform, an automated marketing platform and um, Google apps has some just incredible capabilities that really, once you know how to do it, it are really easy to do. And, and I have a whole video series on how to do everything from opening up your first uh, Google account and Gmail to uh, creating automated marketing emails and automating the response that, for people that are asking for your, for information. Um, and um, like I've got the, it's like the sister course to this eight, eight step course. So, um, if you're interested in that, just, uh, just let me know. We're going to be coming out with that. You're going to probably be starting to see emails as we finish that up. But, um, the two things are, are really kind of go hand in hand. The, the messaging really is what you put on to the, to the information. And the other one is the technology. We had them in one course and we found out there was two completely separate, conversations that we were having all the time so we just decided to pull them apart and take one at a time and and do one um but um that that you can get done really the best thing that you can do for your practice the absolute people always ask me well what's the biggest thing that i can do for um, starting out and growing my practice the number one thing that you should do the first thing that you should do is get a client and prospect list um, that and and you can do that on uh, on the Google Apps and it's really really easy all you have to do is set up a Google Gmail account and um, open up Google Drive and there's a thing called Google Sheets which is the spreadsheet and you just start getting people's first name, last name, email, and phone number on the, the Google sheet and, um, and, and start using it. Your Gmail will automatically capture any email that comes into the, into the system. So just by using Gmail, you're already creating the, the contacts in the contact list. Um, but then you really want to manage that and um, you want to segment that list to you know, this, these are uh, personal contacts versus these are real contacts. And even if you travel around a lot, where you, you know, geography wise, like if I had uh, clients that were down in Florida, I would um, label them as being in Florida. So when you go to Florida, you just send off uh, an email or texts and say, hey, I'm going to be in your area. How about setting up an appointment? And, and then constantly being in touch with those people and developing a relationship with those people so you're not always starting from scratch. And anytime you go to a show, you should record everybody's name and, and uh, on who's there, and you should be sending them texts, emails, um, or private messages, and um, developing that conversation because really only about 3% of the people that you'll ever come in contact with are really ready to do something. And, but as you develop the relationship, that 3% multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. So, so the more people that you have in your list, the more money you're going to make. And the, the more your list grows, the more your business is going to grow. It's just, it's a, uh, you'll see it, it just becomes really almost a mathematical equation that the more people that get in there, the more times that I communicate with them, the more money I make. And, um, so I would say for everybody that's really, that, that if you don't have a list and you're not working your list and developing a relationship with your list, don't do anything else until you get that. Any, any kind of, everyone always says, oh, well, what about Facebook advertising and, you know, and um, SEO and getting my website and everything. This is, this is before you even do a website. You know, I would get your Facebook page, Facebook business page and a list. And uh, from there, people have grown tremendously successful businesses. Very successful. So, 
Um, and Whitney says, that's what I'm trying to do is create a sense of community. Community is really so important because people are, they're wanting to be, um, they're wanting to be a part of a community. Um, I, I sent out an email to everybody on my list. I have about 20,000 people on my list. Um, and I sent out an email to everybody on my list talking about um, the whole concept of building a tribe and the difference between a tribe and creating a tribe and leading a tribe versus selling stuff. And if you start thinking of your business as like I'm selling PMF therapy and it, your, your business is not going to really flourish the way that it could. But if you start thinking about your business as like I'm collecting a tribe of people, a community of people, you know, a, a family, extended family of people that I'm going to lead on the conversation of wellness and try to be their advocate, their expert, their authority on how to, to uh, lead a healthier, um, pain-free life, you will see your business will transform in, in a way that you could only imagine. And um, people, you know, what, one of the things that we do in the, in the marketing class is we try to figure out what is it that your clients, your core, your core clients, your ideal clients, the clients that you would imagine being your best clients, what is their real problem that, that you want to solve? Being in business is nothing more than just solving a problem. Is It's really getting somebody to make a change and that change would make a positive impact in their life. If you're talking about PMF and the whole alternative modality thing, the, the thing that people want more than anything else is that they want to feel good. You know, they don't care what you're using. They don't care about PMF. They don't care about you. They don't care about, um, you know, any kind of studies or anything like else like that. Those are all, you know, really logical conversation in order to justify a decision that's probably already been made. And that decision that's already been made is based on, is this going to help me feel better or feel good and feel better than I am right now? And, um, if you can understand that and communicate that to your tribe, um, then then your business will really will really thrive. And um, so, if you think about the concept of a tribe, a tribe really has been going back really for thousands and thousands of years, fifty thousand years at least. Um, actually, the tribe, the word tribe, comes from one of the twelve original. Um, groups of people back from the, the when the, it was a, the tribe was what one of the 12 groups were called and so it goes back to the original 12 groups of people in, in the world and um, there have been tribes all since then and um, the uh, the concept is that people want to join. And now with social media and, and um, with the way that the, the mass um, conversation is, is evolving, um, people want to join more than one tribe. They want to be in the community. They're really, really wanting to be a part of something that is bigger than themselves and has a common interest. And people love joining tribes. They love joining, being a part of a community. And if you can do that, then you will really, um, your, your business will grow like crazy. Um, so how do you do that? The number one thing is you first have to get a list of the people so you can keep in contact with them. Then you have to have a, a regular uh, way of communicating them. Email is still the absolute, by far the best way to communicate with them. The problem with social media is that unless you're doing paid ads, only one or two or three, maybe 3% if, you're, if your group in Facebook is really, really active. Um, but you can make all these posts in the world. You can have a thousand people in your, uh, in your community, thousand people like your page, and you can do a post and you're, they're only going to see maybe one or 2% of those people are ever going to see that post, even if it's highly engaging. So 
um, you need to do paid ads to your audiences in order to get any kind of reach and frequency, um, you know, so they can see it more than once. But um, email is still by far the cheapest, best, and most personal way to get your message across. And, um, and, and so that's the, the number one way to really get your message out. But the thing that you need to have in your emails is that you need to be providing these people with real insight and information that they find valuable and useful for the specific thing that they've got, you know, the, whatever problem or it is that they've got. And um, they want to hear not nearly as much about about uh, your product and not as much about selling them until they're ready to buy. Once they get through in the buying stage. So there's really three stages of buying. There's first stages like, oh gosh, I don't even know what, I don't even, I know something's wrong. I don't even know what it is. So I'm going to do some research and find out what is it, this thing that, why is my back always hurt? And then the next stage is like, oh gosh, okay, my back hurts. And there's a bunch of different things that can make it feel better. Okay, I've heard about this PMF thing. So they want to hear about PMF in general, in general terms. Like, what does it really do? How can it make me feel better? Then once they decide, yes, PEMF really sounds like it's the thing for me. I really want to give that a try. Then they're interested in who are they going to do it with and why is that person the best for them? So if you start talking about what's best, that you're the best person for them when they're in stage one, they won't even hear it. They won't even see it. They won't be like, like I don't even want to hear about you because I don't even know what PMF is. And, um, and you know, it's, it's like the old thing that uh, if you, have you ever noticed that um, if you're, if you're wanting to buy a car, for example, you know, and you don't know which color to buy. And you, so you're thinking, gosh, what color car do I buy? I don't know. <clears throat> and all of a sudden you start seeing it, you know, I think I want to buy a, a red car. And then, and all of a sudden you start seeing all these red cars, you know, God, red cars everywhere. Everywhere is a red car. You know, all of a sudden you will start becoming more and more aware of that thing that you're thinking about getting. Um, if you're not thinking about it, there can be red cars all over the place. You don't even notice it. You know, it's the same with any kind of buying is that, you know, they really, you, you need to develop, their consciousness of, of the solution before you start talking about your particular solution. So that's the process. Um, and the way that you develop the tribe is by staying in that conversation, that initial conversation of promoting wellness and talking in generalities about why PMF can make them feel good and how to make them feel good overall. Um, so, you know, talking about their overall goal, their big goal, the big goal is to be healthy and to, um, be out of pain and to live a fun life. So, so anyway, I got away from the, the whole competitive situation. So I'm going to do the whole competitive thing. Um, and it's, it's a pretty... It's a pretty long story because um, while PMF is a, a somewhat of a, um, it's a very small, very, very, very small niche, um, it's very fragmented and there really is no, you know, clear dominant factor in that. Um, basically, you've got two different groups of people, of companies. You've got the low intensity people and you've got the high intensity people. The low intensity people really are the, the BM Beamers and IMRS. And there's a couple of smaller part, you know, smaller manufacturers, but Beamer and IMRS are basically the, the two big um, low intensity systems. And then on the high intensity side, you've got pulse centers, you've got PEMF systems, and PEMF systems has several different distributors. And PMF Systems is the manufacturer. They're the people actually making the machines. Pulse Centers is the manufacturer. Pulse Centers also sells Pulse Equine and Pulse Centers. They've got so many different names. They've changed the name five times since I've known them. Um, but um, 
So PEMF Systems, though, is a is a, really a little company that is uh, has a manufacturing little manufacturing plant in Nevada, and they make the same machine, that little green machine with the wheels that Magnaway puts their sticker on, Equipulse puts their sticker on, Dr. Pollock puts his sticker on at PMF 120, and I think there are a couple other little people that that don't sell very many systems at all. Um, so, but that's the same machine. It's the exact same machine. And there are other, they've, they've tried to develop other machines like their solid state. That's their spark gap chamber. And Pulse Centers has a spark gap chamber, the Lily, Lily, Lily Yellow Box and the X1 and the, the double X are all spark gap chambers. Spark gap chambers mean that there is a mechanical part that's in the machine that creates the spark. The pro is really the pro, the beamer, and the IMRS are solid state in that that it's a circuit board. Um, the um, the spark gap chamber it actually has two little pins in there that come together, and as you turn the knob, the pins go farther and farther apart, and that spark needs to jump a bigger and bigger gap. And as that gap widens, it gets more powerful because it needs to jump farther, and it slows down. That's why as you turn up a spark gap chamber, the frequency slows down. So that's the basic technology is a spark gap chamber and um, solid state. The MagnaWave, Equipulse, PMF120 are all the same exact machines. And the PMF Systems has tried to develop a solid state machine. I'm not sure where they are currently, but they, when I was selling for them, they had uh, at least a 50% failure rate because they kept making the, the switch, the, the one part where all the power goes through to go, go out to the cables. They undersized that and that switch was constantly blowing. And the switches are very, very, very expensive. To give you an idea, the switch on the Pro is, is so expensive that it takes a um, very sophisticated engineer to size it and to, to write the specifications for it. And it's, it's so specialized that, that Pulse Center can't sell that machine into certain countries that have high terrorism like Libya and a bunch of other places because they can, be, they can take that, that specific part and turn it into a bomb. That's what they would use to make bombs. So it's a very expensive part and a very high tech part. Uh, PMF Systems has not been able to, to, to um, manage that and, and develop that. So if I were someone that were looking at their system and they said, I wanted to sell you a so solid state, I would wait a while because the jury is still out. They have not been able to really crack that code yet. Um, pulse centers, on the other hand, is their, their solid state system, their pro is rock solid. It's, it's completely, they, they have a failure rate less than 1% from what I understand. And that's as good as you can get. Xerox has the same type of thing is that, you know, these machines are all made up of components. So you've got a box, inside the box are all these components. They buy all the components from all kinds of different places and then they put them together inside the box. And so if people are looking at it like, oh my God, how is my system gonna fail? Usually what happens is there's only one little piece that is inside that box that fails. And pulse centers, for example, and this is, this is what real legitimate manufacturers do, and, and Magna Magnoid people do not fall into this category, but the, what Pulse Centers does that is really excellent is that they track all of their components and where they're manufactured from and what batches they're in. So if they get a part that starts to fail on more than a one or 2% ratio, which means it's no longer just random, means that there's, there's something wrong, they go back and they take that part and they say, look at it and go, hey, is this from the same batch that those other ones have failed? And if it is, they make them change the whole batch and they stop selling or stop using those components. So if you're looking at, at your machine and going, gosh, which machine do I buy? You know, do I get extended warranty and all that? 
what you have to look at is really the cost of, of replacing those components that are inside. And the spark gap chamber really is the only thing that needs to be replaced on a regular basis. And the pulse center spark gap chamber costs about 300 bucks. And that needs to be replaced about every 1500 hours, depending on how much intensity you have. But average intensity, I've seen people run it three to 5,000 hours without changing it. But um, it will start to perform less consistently. Um, so that's the rundown on, on, you know, what is inside the box. Um, that is like the manufacturing of it. Now, the, now, so that's for the high intensity side. There are other manufacturers that are on the high intensity side, like um, PEMF 4000 and PEMF 8000, which are basically the same machines made by a guy named Charlie Figueroli who is really a musician, has good intentions, but doesn't know what he's doing as far as manufacturing goes. Um, he has them manufactured in mass by a guy out of California. At least he, that's what he did the last couple batches. He basically builds them in batches and then sells them. And then when the, the batches are gone, that's it. And he doesn't really have an organization behind it like Pulse Centers does, even MagnaWave. So if you have, some, and they don't have spare parts. So if you, if you, if it fails, you're pretty much done. I mean, they're like, yeah, I can't fix it. You'd have to buy a new one or you'd have to, to, to take yours in and then sell you a new one, which he's, I don't believe has been, you know, ready to do. Um, so those PMF 4,000, PMF 8,000s are very, very, very cheap machines. They're like $12,000, $10,000, something like that. And um, inside the components are really, really cheap, They're the cheapest you can get. And they make them as cheap as they can get them. And they make them in mass and then they, they sell them out. Um, so what you want is you really want to have an organization that stands behind their machine and is able to fix it. That's like the number one thing that you really want. Um, and Pulse Centers does have that. And um, um, now MagnaWave, the PMF 1000, or PMF uh, Systems, you know, is owned by a guy that is like mm, 78 years old. And, um, you know, he, he's, his primary interest is basically just keeping it going until he either sells it or, you know, retires. And um, so the, there's not a whole lot of real development going on. The machine is the same machine that it's been in the last 10 years, 15 years, maybe. And um, inside, there's not much going on uh, new-wise, technology-wise. Now, the um, and that brings me to the low-intensity systems. The low-intensity systems, like the IMRS and the Beamers, are all FDA-regulated. And they use this very, very heavily in their marketing. Um, and what that means is the FDA does not approve anything that is not a drug because they're food and drug administration, not food and machine association. So their idea of what, what cures is it has to be a drug. So what they do do is they will, they will um, review your machine and they will say, they will give you what's called a FDA regulation or certification and says, yes, the machine is what it says it is and it does what it says it's going to do. So that means what you need to do is you need to say it, what it does specifically. The IMRS specifically is FDA regulated for improved blood circulation and minor aches and pains. The Beamer only for um, one of those two. It's not both of them. I think it's, I think it's blood circulation, um, which, you know, nobody buys it. Nobody uses PMF for to improve their blood circulation, but it was the one thing that they can prove that it did, you know, they, 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 you know, clinically could prove that it improved their blood circulation. So, I mean, I bet, has any of you ever had somebody come to you and said, hey, I want to get a PMF treatment to improve, improve my blood circulation? Anybody? Um, minor aches and pains, you know, if they have a little minor aches and pains, it's just take an aspirin, you know. <laughs> they, they, you know, take a warm bath, you know, that's, that's, 
that's, you know, if you, you know, why would you spend thousands of dollars on something that, that, you know, is going to improve your minor aches and pains. Um, but that's what they could prove. So that's what they got. That's what they got FDA regulated. And, and the negative side of this, the major negative side of it is that, um, that locks their technology in a box. They cannot change that. Otherwise, they lose their FDA approval. So um, they're, and both those machines are now coming on hmm, probably at least six, seven, maybe eight years since that has been done. So their machine, their technology has been stuck in a box using the same components and the same design, you can't even change the color. This is how strict it is. So um, those machines, and you know, would you go and buy a laptop that was eight years old? You know, the technology, this is, these are basically just circuit boards in there, you know, with buttons on, on the outside. And so would you go, you know, think about your laptop or, or, or your, your computer, you know, would you want to go and buy a computer that was eight years old, you know, and hadn't been improved in eight years and using the same circuit boards and the same the same um, technology as as uh, as has been for eight years. No, you wouldn't. You would, you know, there's no way you would. But that's what those systems are, and that's the problem that they have. And to get a new approval, we're literally talking millions and millions of dollars and several years worth of testing that goes on. That's um, a very very difficult process to go through. Very expensive process. And and again, it, it, what does it do? It gives you that 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 very limited approval. So um, what is it, what do the low intensity systems do? Um, I use the analogy of um, gardening. So here in North Carolina, we've just planted our, our uh, garden and we built a couple of raised beds and we've got our cucumbers and tomatoes and uh, peppers all planted and um, so I use the analogy of, of like watering your garden. And um, there is no good or bad when it comes to, to PMF. I mean, to me, it's all good. It's just, just like when you're watering your garden. You know, it's all good. It's just water getting onto the, to the dirt to, to water the plants. It's really a question of like how much water do you want to get onto the, in, into the soil. With the low-intensity devices, it's like watering your garden with a little – sprinkler like a little mist fine mist so if you're standing there with a little mist you just have to stay a while and so the more that you're on the um the low intensity systems now that's fine if you have time um we actually had a, an imrs system that we put under our bed and we turned it on before we went to bed and we and we turned it on before we got out of bed and we let it go and it really it actually really felt good and uh it helped us sleep and we definitely got some benefit from it. People I've sold them to have definitely gotten benefits from it. But as a practitioner, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell somebody, hey, this is going to take a couple of weeks before you start really feeling it, you know, keep coming back. And they're like, oh, are you kidding me? People want to know that they got some something done in one session. And that's where the high intensity is. The high intensity is like a hose with that a really strong hose so that you, you can really water your garden very quickly and very thoroughly um, in a short amount of time. That's what high intensity does. And it gives you the capability to very much uh, control the frequency and the intensity. So you have three main things when you're looking at a PMF system. You're looking at the intensity, which is how strong it is, measured in Tesla or Gauss, and you have the frequency, which is how many beats per second. And then you have the wave form. And that's the graphical representation of when the power goes on, stays on for a while, and then comes off. So the waveform is nothing more than that, just showing how it goes on, stays on, and then turns off. Um, a lot of people make a big deal about the wave. And the wave, there really is no... There is no device that is on the market today that can accurately um, differentiate the effects of waveform. 
So it's never been proved which waveform is better than the others. And, 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 and when people start talking about one waveform is better than the other, it's just marketing. It really makes, there's zero difference. What is a difference is though, is how much PMF system is going, how much PMF is going into your cells. And that is being turned on, staying on for a period of time and then turning off. And we're talking about, you know, really like seven or eight times in a, in a second. So, um, you know, the, the time periods are very, very small. And then people always talk about, well, you know, the measurements, you know, oh, how important is the Gauss or the Gauss rating? The, the, the real story behind Gauss is that it's all a lie. They've all, all the manufacturers are completely lying when it comes to Gauss because it's a theoretical mathematic calculation. And it doesn't matter like it, it would be saying like, well, I, don't, I can't think of an analogy, but anyway, the, the, the difference is that the Gauss rating on a machine matters as to where do you take the measurement? Do you take it right out of the machine or do you take it at the end of an eight foot lead or an end of a 10 foot lead or a 12 foot lead? The pulse centers has 12 foot leads. So the longer the lead, the more resistance and the lower the, the, the rating. If you have a large loop, if it's in a circle, a straight, a, a perfect circle, that has a higher Gauss rating than if it were oblong or, or less than a circ perfect circle. So how exactly are you measuring that rating? And then um, the other thing is, is that the measuring devices are not standardized. So for example, and this is really important if someone starts saying, talking to you about, oh, what are the specifications of your machine? You, you know that first off, they don't know anything of what they're talking about. Um, but these are this are this is powerful information that you can use to show them that it's not really about the specifications; it's about how it makes you feel. But so to measure a system, the measure the Gauss, you first have to measure. Well, there's a, in a very fraction of a second, the power goes on, it goes up into a peak, and then it turns off is the machine measuring from trough to trough and averaging it? Is it measuring it from peak to peak and averaging it? Is it measuring it from the middle to the middle and measuring it? Is it measuring from peak to, to, to trough and averaging it? There are no standardized way to measure that. Every single machine measuring device that's out there, and you can get one for $35 at Amazon, and you can get one for $35,000. And they all have a very different way of measuring that. And some of them will be averaged over, say, a minute time span. So an IMRS, their Gauss, if you put a Gauss rating on, you'll see that the frequency is going up and down. The, the intensity is going up and down. Their frequency intensity waveforms are scrambled. So if you have a device that's averaging them, what information are you getting versus the information that is coming out of a $35,000 machine is, is probably, you would think, more accurate. But the point of it all is, is that specifications are not really the relevant thing to talk about when you're talking about the machines. Um, the companies like to talk about that because they feel like they can you know, people will go, oh, yeah, I'm used to buying stuff. I used to look at the specifications. That should mean something. So, you know, in the, the way that most people in the United States think is that uh, more is better. So if I have a car that has more horsepower, that's better than the car that has less horsepower. So that must mean this machine is better. And so as a consequence, the, the manufacturers have just kind of like, you know, ratcheted up the, the Gauss ratings and, um, you know, to, to say, oh, well, you know, mine's better. But really, in the grand scheme of things, those are not really relevant conversations to have. Um, so, um, but you probably want to have some of the background behind that. That's the background. And uh, I probably had that conversation thousands of times with people wanting to buy machines. So, um, so what else do you guys want to hear about? Um, I'm kind of going on. Um, we talked a little bit about marketing. Talked a little bit about the machines. Uh, 
Are you guys still awake? <laughs> we actually had somebody fall asleep on this a little while ago. But now you guys are all, all except for Ethlin, all have your screens blacked out. Yes, Ethlin, I can see you. <laughs> so as a consequence, I'm just talking to you. It's like I'm just talking to you in a bunch of blank screens. <laughs> Uh, um, so what, what other, come on, you guys got to have some questions. Uh, oh, tinnitus. I, Becky, are you talking about tinnitus? Are you talking about the ringing in your ears? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Um, the ringing of the ears, you know, I've had uh, several different people buy, buy the machines based on, on getting results with that. Um, I don't really know if there is a protocol on that. What I would do, and um, I have a little bit of ringing in my ears and stuff, and, and uh, what, um, what I do is, um, you know, that is a very much, you know, what's in your eardrum is a very much you would consider a, a neurological or nerve type of, of, a, of a thing that you're trying to affect. So you would definitely treat it with a very high frequency, very low intensity, like 7.8 and only to the level that you could really just first feel it. And then the more the better, you know, and, and see if uh, you get results from that. But um, I would definitely keep the frequency. Now, if you have a spark gap chamber, you really want to just have it very, very low. Start it out. And, uh, and I would actually think that uh, the um, small loops on each side would, would, be, would be good. Um, but then you also want to take the small loops and just kind of move it around and see where you're feeling the, um, the pressure and see where you're feeling the, um, the pulsing. And then stay on that until until it goes away. Um, I don't know, did that did that help? Which you know that kind of that that kind of approach really is the framework for all of our treatments. You know, it's find out what where it's pulsing, stay on it. Don't do it too much. You know, only do it to the level that you, you can feel it pulsing, and then as the pulsing diminishes, turn it up and see if it comes back um do you ever see a remote control for the dials <laughs> i don't know that's that's probably proprietary but i can tell you that um the double x when it was released it was supposed to come with remote control so i don't know where it is in the development path i don't know what the development path looks like for pulse centers. But um, we originally were going to have that released with the double X. And now the double X is, I don't know, however long. And John, we visited about the different frequencies um, measured in plants based on their leaves to their roots to their, you know, stock stem. How would you apply that same principle to um, the equine side of thing would it just be legs body neurological or what, what, how would you apply those same analogies yeah that it's it's the the similar similar type thing the um the hardest part about doing that with um with equine is that you can't ask them how that feels right so for me you know, the way that I differentiate about, you know, what treatment I should be and what frequency I should be doing it is that if you know, it's, you're, you're pulsing somebody and you're trying to decide, well, what is it that, that really is going on here in their leg or their back or whatever, and you're pulsing. And so you, you start out at a low intensity. If you have a spark gap chamber, you start at a low intensity, which is a high frequency. And you say, okay, so how does that feel? You know, do you start feeling it? And then as you're turning it up, you know, pay attention to how that feels. If you have a nerve, the sensation that I feel when it's a nerve is like a tingly feeling. And the tingly feeling does 
follow the path of the pain. So it will shoot down your, your leg, or if it's in your shoulder, it'll shoot down your arm. Um, it will follow the path of pain. And, and it's a very much of a tingly feeling. Um, if it's a muscle, tendon, ligament, you kind of feel more of a pulsing, like a, you know, a, um, the, the muscle is pulsing. It's not a tingly feeling, but, um, and if it's a bone, to me, it really feels like, like I had a real problem with my hips and when I first started pulsing and when I get it on my hips, it felt like someone was taking a tuning fork and whacking it into my, into the bones. So I would have this like ting, ting, ting feeling inside my bone. And I've treated people with fractures and uh, they said the same thing, that they could feel the vibration inside the bone and where it was fractured, they could actually feel like if it was a um, flat fracture, you know, that was severe enough, they could actually feel the, the different, the two different parts, you know, vibrating against each other. But um, so with a horse though, you can't ask them, how does that feel? You know, hey, tell me how this feels, you know. You just really have to look at the clues and the clues are, are they showing signs of you know, relief or agitation as you go through the different cycles? So if, you're, so if you're looking at it from, like if you're trying to, to diagnose the legs and you have it on the, like a normal horse, you could turn that, the, the small or medium loops up on the legs full blast and they should be just standing there going, yeah, yeah, this is okay. Um, but if you have uh, an injury, they're going to see, they're going to start showing reactions like, ow, lifting the leg up, you know, um, moving away from it um, way before you're even probably at half, halfway. And so what you're looking at is where are they showing signs of reaction? Um, is it, because if it's a nerve, a nerve does not want to have a lot of intensity. So they're going to show you a reaction way sooner than any muscle tendon, ten, tendon and then bone is going to kind of come at the end. Um, so based on that kind of loose reaction, you can start to understand what's going on inside their body. Um, of course, the deeper it goes into the body, the more you run into the problem of, well, am I turning it up just to get that power deep into their body or is this you know where, where the the cells are that are being affected but um either way the, the the treatment is about the same is that you just turn it up to the level that they feel comfortable and then when they get to the level so that is comfortable you can try to turn it up a little more and just keep turning it up until you get to the level that it would normally be for a healthy body when it gets to that level then you know, okay, well, they're reacting the same way a healthy person would react in, you know, natural, the cell's natural state. So you have to assume that you've, you've gotten to that point. Thanks. That answer, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thank you. Anybody else? So, um, so I guess uh, Sherry is not with us. She really wanted to be with us, but um, her mom has, um, we've just found out, has uh, really, really advanced cancer. And so she's had a full day of, uh, and a full couple of weeks of tests and tests and tests, which are just not, uh, not good. So, um, I know that Sherry's always looking forward to doing these things, but I think she was just beyond spent and didn't have anything left to give. And, you know, if you know Sherry, you know she she gives and gives and gives until she doesn't have any more, and she's kind of at that point. Um, and Samantha is at our little Oliver's baseball game, and uh, she was going to try to get on, but the baseball the, the baseball field is like it's in a valley. And I'm like, I know that there's no cell coverage. She's like, I'm going to try to log on when I get there. I'm like, you can barely even get a phone to load 
much less uh, play one of these things. So I know they're here in spirit. Um, so anyway, this, uh, this course has been a lot of fun and um, we've um, gotten to the end of, of the stuff that we really wanted to talk about. Um, if there's more stuff that you want to talk about, just uh, put them in the, the, the chat. And um, keep in mind um, that the, the portal you have access to, unlimited access to, for a year. And so you can always go back to these things and, and rewatch them. You can go and look at the, the um, resources, but I would strongly encourage you to go through all the bonus material. And there's a lot of bonus material. I mean, um, that uh, includes um, all kinds of treatment sheets, all kinds of eBooks. Um, I posted a bunch of eBooks on marketing. I put in uh, a bunch of um, videos. The frequency videos are all in there. So you can go and put them on your phone and um, I would just do is, is go and, and record them right onto your phone, play them on the, on the computer and record them. And um, you know, so you have them right on your phone. And then when you're running to mimic the frequency, like a 7.8 frequency, you just replay the, the recording and harmonize your machine to that level so they're ticking at the same time and you've got the frequency. Um, and then you'll, you'll see that as you do that a bunch, you will we'll really pretty much know what a 7.8 frequency sounds like or what a 5.0 frequency sounds like um, and a, a 6.5. Um, the 6.5 really do not, um, Forget about that because when you're feeling sick or under the weather or you have somebody that is that is uh, <clears throat> has a sickness that's coming on, you know, cold, flu, whatever, let them sit on a 6.5 frequency for an hour or two and uh, you'll just see that it's just amazing how that sickness will just vanish. I haven't been sick. I'm going to say, I shouldn't say this because then I'll, I'll, I might get sick, but I really have not been sick in years. And uh, anytime I feel anything like that coming on, just go and sit on 6.5. And I do a whole whole range of frequencies. I'll go from mm, 7.8 to 4.0 to 2.0, back up to 6.5, 10. And I'll, I'll just keep doing the whole spectrum of, of uh, change of frequencies every 5 to 10 minutes. And um, I get done and I feel great. So that for long-term health is really the best way to go. Um, so Ethlyn is asking, <coughs> are you going to do a presentation on lameness? Any <coughs> I'm not sick. I have the pollen. <coughs> That is <coughs> hitting my throat. <coughs> Tips on what? <coughs> Cover in the slideshow or things. <coughs> See, I shouldn't have talked <coughs> talked about being sick. <coughs> All right, so Ethlyn's asking, any tips on what to for sure cover in the slideshow or things for sure not to write down in the slideshow? <clears throat> on lameness, um, so one thing I would for sure not say is that we don't diagnose any lameness. Um, what we do is we show you the reactions from the PMF. So we're not diagnosing any lameness. Um, if you start saying that, you're going to get in trouble with your vet friends. Um, but what I would say 
is um, first off, I would go and really read up on um, and and watch what um, you know our our injury and um, 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 oh, what was her name um, that, that we did on uh, on not Kelly Lagarotta but uh, uh, the girl from Wisconsin. Um, I would go and and review hers, but um, I'm not sure. The, the the things all right so evelyn what are you going to be doing as far as um lameness on horses are you talking about yeah so i'm actually doing a presentation with my vet and we're going to talk about uh like she's going to talk about the ways to the way she figures out where the lameness is coming from and the options as far as um if it's bone or soft tissue and and then at the end i'm going to come in and just talk about kind of like a prevention and then if there is a lameness issue it's it's pretty vague um and i have giving this presentation to do what who are you giving this presentation to you're doing it with your vet yes and it's going to be at a local facility where it's just going to be for local people basically okay and your vet is obviously very pro pmf oh yes very much yeah are you going to have a horse to do it with, or are you just doing it talking? No, just talking. I'll have a slideshow, and there's four TVs in the room, um, but I'm not going to have any animals in there. Okay, so I would just really, the, what I would do is, is, is kind of give them the background on what it is that you see when a, you encounter a, a sore spot. Like for example, if you're treating their legs and you're moving it up and down the legs and you get to the area, say the horse has a sore knee and you know, so you're going starting at the hoof and you have it at medium intensity and you start moving it up and you start getting close to that knee and then they show you signs of resistance. So the horse is gonna show you, hey, I've got something, you know, something there is sore and is reacting to the PMF. Where it reacts is where the cells have, have damaged and are reacting to the PMF and cells that that have that are are um not damaged or are completely healthy in their natural state the magnetic field just goes right on through so you're not seeing any reaction so when you see a reaction that tends to believe that there are specific um, cells that need repair and what PMF does is returns them back to their natural state. So when you, you are looking for lameness, what you're really looking for, you're looking for those points that show reaction. Right. And you can do that anywhere, you know, anywhere on their body. So what you're really looking for is the, the body, the cells to start to pulse. When it's a hard, you know, a hard, uh, like a bone, um, you're going to need more intensity than when it's a soft tissue. Nerves is going to be even less. So the higher the intensity that you get the reaction from. And so what you have to do is you have to start out low and work your way up. If, for example, you think that there's something wrong in the front right leg, you would start at the, the, the hoof or the, the, in the shoulder, and you'd start basically going up and down the um the limb until you start finding areas of reaction and then as you find those areas of reaction you get closer and closer and closer until you can get to the point where you go all right when i get really right on this one spot i get a reaction so good chances that's where the spot is right is there a better word to use other than prevention prevention of of, of lameness yeah. Well, I would talk about wellness. You know, what you're really doing is you're promoting wellness. Okay. Yeah. But why do you have a problem with prevention? It's not that I don't have a problem or that I do have a problem. It's more of I don't want people to get the the, the mindset of, if I pulse them frequently, they're never going to injure themselves. When in reality, they can still injure themselves, but having PMF done frequently is going to help the body 
kind of fight against whatever may happen. But I don't want people to think that, oh, I'm pulsing weekly and nothing ever is going to happen to my horse. The likelihood that it happens is, is less. So this is really what happens. And are you talking to people that have injuries and are getting recovered or, or not? I have no idea. So we're yeah. going to, we we just started doing this, um, but we're going to just put it out there to the local people and then see who shows up. Because I can tell you the biggest, I think my, from my own experience and, and my um, personal uh, experience, first off, it's a lot easier to, um, treat yourself before you're sore and prevent the soreness from coming on than it is to get rid of the soreness once it's there. So, um, so that is for sure uh, a, a definite advantage in more regular treatments. But if you have an injury, if you have a horse that has an injury, the question always becomes, you know, why should I spend all this money treating them? And one of the biggest payoffs is number one, they will absolutely repair their cells faster than if they didn't. But number two, and this is really important, is that when a horse is injured, they end up getting compensatory sorenesses and injuries and on their road to recovery because the compensatory muscles, tendons, ligaments are become so overtaxed that when they start working them, they are very, very fragile. By treating them, you work out all those imbalances so the horse is a lot more balanced, not only on the injured area, but also the areas that were getting overused by staying off of that one injured area. So I can give you an example. We had this horse, Millie, who is a great, who is from New Zealand. When we got him, I don't know, he was mid-teens when we got him. He was a great uh, um, four-star event horse and um, hardy as anything, never been out in the stalls and uh, never been in a stall until he came to the United States, imported from New Zealand. And, uh, and so right before my daughter's uh, one star, first one star, long format, this is going back a ways, but so he was like super fit. He pulled the suspensory and we're like, oh man, and uh, this is before PMF. And uh, so when we were trying to bring him back, um, he, w you know, he needed to stay in stall rest for like, first, it first started out, they were like, oh, stay in stall rest for, for 60 days and then start hand walking him. Well, that was fine, the stall rest, we could do that. But then once we started hand walking him, he would just explode. And sure enough, he had a left front suspensory and he would injure something on his right front, like, and then boom, right back to square one. And that, and so he would kind of re-injure the suspensory and then tear something off in, in the other, on the other corner. And we went and did that for like a year. It took us three or four times to come back. And each time we would start coming back and he'd blow out the other side. And when we, when we started using PMF, we found out that doesn't happen. You know, you, you, you were, you're really helped with the, uh, compensatory sorenesses so so um i don't know if that helped you it did i'm writing notes <laughs> that's good um tracy asked would avoidance work um avoidance avoidance of the issue <laughs> No, uh, she asked about prevention. So I was just thinking of synonyms that may sound. So I was just oh. thinking avoid versus, pre I mean, I don't know. It's just synonymous. Prevention. One seems more treating. The other one seems a little bit, um, yeah. I, I don't know. I was just throwing it out there. No, appreciate that. Um. <clears throat> No, I, when you, you said uh, would avoidance work, you know, my, since we're like, you know, up to here in, in cancer treatment, one of the, the more popular ways of dealing with things is to avoid them. Right. <laughs> and that's kind of the, 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 the school that we're in now. Cancer? What cancer? Right. Oh, What's cancer? 
Um, you know, it's like a teenager though, you, you know, if you avoid them, they, they just, it just gets worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My daughter's an oncologist nurse. Uh, so yeah, I have appreciation for, for all of that. Yeah. Well, you know, it really just goes to, um, you know, they had a meeting with, uh, with our, with a fabulous friend of the family and, and, uh, and cancer surgeon that has really been the first guy that actually looked at her whole body and figured out what was going on and said, Oh, it's cancer. Um, but, um, you know, the, the state of the um, healthcare healthcare system that we're in right now is um, is horrible. There really is a bunch of specialists that all they do is look at their own specialty. And she had a hip injury, and she she um, as as a result, they replaced her hip not once but twice. And at the first time, her, her bones were in such brittle shape that she fractured her hip after she was trying to do therapy on, on a new hip. And, um, and the, she has this huge mass in her hip of, of a cancerous tumor. And it's like the doctor was like, yeah, they, they had to have known that was there. And so, um, you know, we really started doing a lot of soul searching as to what is going on with the healthcare system of today and, and what can we do about it? You know, we're always about change and trying to um, do whatever we can in our little world. And um, the, uh, and, and, and Tracy, forgive me, but I, the, the image is really small, but is that a seahorse on your, on your logo or am I just like seeing things? <laughs> it is actually a seahorse. And then it's got the water and the three leaves of healing. Um, my brother actually drew that for our business for me. Well, it's funny because that when trying to think of a way to communicate this whole subject that, that I'm, that I'm trying to get on is that there's, you know, there's a story about this, uh, the guy walking along the beach and he sees a little seahorse and he's throwing these seahorses back into the water. And they, so his friend goes like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you throwing those seahorses back in the water? And the guy's like, well, you know, I want them to live. And they're here's on the sand, they're stranded. They get stranded by the tide. So I'm going to throw them back in. And he's like, there's like millions of seahorses on the beach. Like, like, what does that matter? Like, how does that do anything? And he goes, well, it doesn't matter to anybody except for that one little seahorse, you know? Uh -huh. And, and, and that's kind of where we are in the healthcare system is that what can we do about it? Well, we can only do you know, what is in our little area. And as an alternative healthcare practitioner, what can you do? You know, you can lead your tribe into the, the, and the, the conversation of wellness and focus in on making the people that you come in contact with, your little seahorses, um, feel better and be their advocate on, on healthcare. And you, we are never going to be able to fix the healthcare system. There's just, no. it's, it's terminal. I mean, it's the only people that it truly benefits are the drug companies and they own it. I mean, and they created it and it's, it's theirs. I mean, the FDA is bought and paid for by the, by the drug companies and mm -hmm. the doctors are compensated by the drug companies. So there's, it's never going to, it's never going to change. We've gone for, through from a system, we've evolved from a system like the, the rest of the manufacturing, less, less than the industrial revolution has happened, is that we've gone into mass, mass production healthcare. Um, just like the cars went through of being singly produced. And then Henry Ford decided, hey, we can build a factory. We can mass produce these things. It's like Ray Kroc did with McDonald's. Hey, we can specialize and turn hamburger flippers and french fries makers and and make make uh mass produced food and the healthcare system went that direction too they decided well we don't want to be a general practitioner anymore we need to be specialists i'm a, you know you know i'm a neurovascular radiologist you know and and all i do is you know all i do is hip replacement so you've got something sore on your leg you must need a hip replacement 
And, and, but as an alternative healthcare provider, as a PMF practitioner, you can take a different track. You can go and you can, can say, all right, I'm not going to talk about treating symptoms with a modality. I'm going to talk about promoting wellness. And I do that from the perspective of treating with PMF. Um, but you can also widen the conversation and lead your tribe into wellness rather than talking about sickness. And, you know, that's what I want to encourage everybody as you go forward is to try to lead your tribe in the conversation about wellness and how you can make everybody feel good with your PMF system. And that is going to be the big thing that you're going to help um, your little seahorses in your, on your little beach of the world. And um, if, um, if everybody tries to uh, get a better understanding of that conversation, I think your business as a whole will, will do a lot better. So, mm -hmm. and as we go forward, you know, um, this is the last class, but by no means is our, uh, is our communication over and as um, nor is our support or um, the resources that you have available to you. So um, make sure that, you know, if there's something that we can do, you reach out to us and, and let us know. And, um, and if I have a delay in responding to you, I will not be offended at all. If you send me a second email and say, Hey, did you get my first one? Because I've had, just this today, I've had three emails that I was really wanting to respond, respond to only to find out that they were in my junk folder. And it's like, how does that happen? You know, I've been corresponding back and forth to these people and then boom, it goes into my junk folder. And I have like eight emails and I get hundreds of emails every day. And so if I miss some or they, some goes into the junk folder or they get buried I'm literally, I'll, like I said, just sent out an email with, with about uh, 20,000 emails. I, I could get three or 400 responses. Wow. Not to mention three or 400 junk emails that I get on a regular basis. <laughs> so moving forward, what, what is our next steps in terms of preparation for um, certification? What, what, what are our next steps? Ah, good question. We have the test. Um, you're going to get an email with a link to the test, and the test is a 40-question test. You just click on the link; it'll take you to this. To this, uh, it's an, actually a Google form, and uh, you, you go through the, the questions. And if you need to get out of the 40, you need to get 36 of them right in order to get your um, be eligible for uh, um, being certified with the American Association of Den uh, Drugless Practitioners. And um, we give you a certificate. I, I wanted to have one here, but uh, it's a very nice certificate. It's suitable for framing. And you'll get the electronic version first and then the paper version. Um, as we're trying to do them in batches. So, you know, as, as we get a group of them, then we put, do them all together and send them out in batches. So, you know, if, if you get yours done and it's, you don't get yours right away, then that's why. But um, all you really need to do is just tell the guys, the Dr. Rosenthal at AADP, that, that you are approved for certification. If he has any questions, he'll call, he'll email me. But um, you can say I'm I'm approved, and uh, you will have an email saying you passed, and that will give you uh, eligibility for your uh, your AADP cert board certification. They take a little bit of time doing that. Is this certification also AADP? Yes. The, AA, the process is you, you take our certification, you pass our test, um, you get our um, letter of certification, you take that to the AADP, and I think it's $285. There is an annual membership that I think is $150, which you do not need to go on. Um, all you need to do is just pay the $285 and you get board certified through the AADP. And then you are, are um, legitimately certified. Now, if you want to use our certification, we are actually an accredited, uh, fully accredited 
uh, higher education um, and our certification, you know, it is, uh, is approved by them. So if you just want to use our certification, that's fine with us. You know, if you want to go the extra step and get it certified through the ADP, that's fine too. Is there any benefits or consequences to going on and getting it certified through them? You get, they do have an insurance program. Uh-huh. And, and uh, if, you're, if you're certified through them, then you do get uh, uh, eligible for that certification. Now, we're also working on a certification from a company in, uh, in uh, Australia, the international, the II, IICT. Um, and it also has uh, certification and, and we're going through the approval process on that. And uh, you would also be eligible to get certified there as soon as we get the, the green light that um, were available or were approved you know, you'll get an email saying, hey, you can also get certified there. That's an international certification and you won't need to do anything else. Your certification from us, from this course will, will, um, will apply. Um, but they have, they have uh, certifications available for, for 1,300 different modalities. PMF is not one of them and we're the first ones to go through the PMF process. Wow. So that would be a really, that would be a really good thing and they have, uh, they have certification, I mean, they have insurance available um, for their members as well. And so is this a, um, is there an expiration or is this um, continuing? No. no expiration, okay. Nope. And no, there is not another test to take from the ADP, just the fee. Yeah, our test is, has been approved for, from, from them. That's why we had to go through all the, the hoops and with them. Are you familiar with the hands-on, um, hands-on trade or something like that in terms of insurance? Hands-on, I think that's the company, hands-on trade. No. Okay. No. Um, and there's the yeah so the the um certification is is um really just uh, taking the test and the test you know don't go and get crazy about the test if you've been if you've paid attention through our uh classes you shouldn't have a problem i took the test and i got two wrong <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i'm not a good ta i'm not a good test taker but um but all you have to do is just take the test again you can, I mean, you can take it again, like in five minutes and, and it tells you what, what you got wrong and what the right answer is. So, um, you just, we, we don't want, it's not like we're like trying to hang you up and, you know, flunk you. We want you to pass. And we created the test really as a way to make sure that people are understanding. And we, you know, the test, I mean, I think it covers really good stuff. Um, so, you know, we, we want it, we want the uh, accreditation to be, to mean something and the certification to mean something so that um, people know, hey, these guys have gone the extra mile and, and, um, you know, done the work that shows that they're in this for real. And, you know, as far as, um, the long-term benefits of it is the, if you want to earn more, you learn more. And the more you learn, the better you're going to be. And the more, that's really the way that the, that's job security as a practitioner. Or the more it, you learn, the less you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the, what is it? Uh, the, um, what is it? The, the um, novices have, Many options, the masters have few. Right. A little quote from Lao Tzu. Um, is Pulse Center certification AADP approved? I do not believe so. They may have, I don't know. Um, I read MagnaWave was. 
I, I read that too, but I also re have read that they are um, being um, FDA approved, which they are not. So it doesn't really matter if they are not. Actually, I mean, the best thing that can happen as an industry is that everybody gets certified and that uh, any people outside of the industry like vets or governments or, you know, uh, state boards, state veterinary boards start looking at the industry and they go, you know, this industry, they have their own certification program. They have their own education program. These people are dedicated. These people are knowledgeable. They know what they're doing. That's the biggest fear that, that, that any governmental body has is that they have a bunch of people running around that don't know what they're doing and they're hurting people. So if we can show as an industry that we are independently educating and um, watching our own, our own stuff, they will go away. They'll be like, we don't need to do this. And I've, I've actually, um, I've actually been told that by some very high up FDA officials is that, that from not, not FDA, um, FEI um, officials. And, and when there was a whole conversation going on about whether or not PMF would be allowed or not allowed, um, their impression of the industry was uh, that there were a bunch of magna waves, people running around waving the magic wand and didn't know what they were doing. And, um, you know, we really showed them, no, we have training programs and we have, uh, you know, really are, are going the extra mile to be knowledgeable and professional and um, not doing uh, harm. And because of that, I think they kept the door open. So any more questions? And that test will come out within the next couple of weeks. What's that? Will that test come out in the next couple of weeks? I think you'll get it tomorrow. Oh. It's already made. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll send the the, um, the link out to everybody. It's just a link. You check, click on the link, and now one one thing I have to say: make sure you use the same email as you've done with your uh, registering for the class. Because people have several different emails, and the when you use a different email, it basically makes it look like you're a, a new person to our system. Then we gotta go. Oh, wait, who is this person again? <clears throat> Any other questions? Oh, so so I've got a couple questions for you guys. Um, so out of every, every, uh, course we have, you know, the people that come to these, 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 um, live sessions a lot. Um, and then some people don't, don't come at all. Um, do you guys feel that the live sessions are, are worth it? Um, yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> and Ethlyn, you say that because you've been watching the replays. But but you 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 would have liked to have participated live if you could have. Yeah, just because if I have random questions, it's easier to ask live. If I'm watching the replay, nine times out of ten, I'm gonna forget. Once I'm able to email or something, I'm gonna forget what I was wanting to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and each class is a little bit, a little bit different in their, in their reaction -ness, but, um, yeah, that, that, that's what we found too, is a, it, and that's why we've gone to this format as opposed to we, we started out with a live, uh, with a, a webinar format, which was just me talking. And the only way that you could ask questions was if we put it into the chat. So. <clears throat> All right. 
So, well, I'm glad you guys have all participated and um, all the people that are in replay land. If you do have questions, you can always email me. And um, we're really so happy that you have joined us and uh, are continuing on this journey to wellness with us. And um, we hope that you'll really keep going and, and um, help raise the bar in, in uh, PMF and, and um, the world. So um, now you guys are our little miracles out there and uh, we're living vicariously through you. So go out and be, be all you can be. Um, anybody else have any questions? Ah, okay. We got live is more personal, like being in a classroom. I enjoyed live feed when I'm able to attend. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's, that's good information. <clears throat> so maybe we'll keep doing the live. This is this next one though. We're going to do one more starting May 22nd. And then we probably are not going to do another one for at least at least until September, more like maybe October. Um, our schedule has gotten filled up with other things. And um, so we're going to, so you guys have gotten in on it. And now you have access to the, all this stuff for a year. You have our support for a year. And I hope you take advantage of it. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you guys very, very much for Thank joining you. us. And we love you all. For Sherry and Samantha, thanks a lot. Hey.